Well, hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jason Levine, and thank you so much for joining me today on the Friday Masterclass, where today it is an AMA, an Ask Me Anything, pretty casual, going to be relying on you, the chat, to drive it. Otherwise, I've actually got a couple things I want to showcase anyway, of course. A couple things in the Premiere Pro beta that would be uh, very interesting to probably all of you if you're editing video. Um, I want to emphasize again, if you're not checking out the Premiere Pro betas, or for that matter, the Photoshop beta in particular, you've seen me show Gen Phil and some of the new uh, uh, Firefly-driven features in Photoshop here on the stream a couple times in the last few months, uh, you definitely want to be doing that. Anybody has access, everybody who's a Creative Cloud member has access to the betas. You can download them via the Creative Cloud desktop. They get updated almost daily, in particular for Premiere and Photoshop, if not if not every day, almost every day. And uh, it's also a great way to just see kind of what we're working on. And if you want to just explore and experiment, don't recommend doing a full project in the beta necessarily, because it's a beta, but play around, have some fun. Uh, as always, we're coming to you live across multiple networks. So thank you for joining us on LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, Behance, and Facebook. So great to see you. Thank you so much. Welcome. And uh, let's give a couple shouts today. We got Tim, we have Reverb Mike, Umicorn, Gino, Cody Bear. Nice to see you all here. Let's see who's chiming in on this side. We've got Robins Drones, great to see you from Portland. Nice to see you. Oh, Gino, you're in Brussels, huh? Oh, nice. Okay. Great to see you too. Thank you so much for joining. Stephanie, Corinne, Jean, Jim, Bar. Ba I can't read that one. Man. Got some new glasses coming in. <laughs> you know, my prescription didn't change for years, but all of a sudden it's changing because, you know, age. Okay, so uh, I see Tim, who works here, has a question. Thanks for kicking it off, dude. Uh, around audio interfaces. Uh, and uh, he's asking, are there any that work particularly well with Audition, Premiere, and is there even a difference? That's a great question, actually. So uh, as mentioned multiple times in here, let me see if I can see if I can pull up. I've got a little document here that maybe I can use to share as I'm talking. So um, yeah, audio interfaces. So this comes up a lot, and the truth is these days, so like now, as far as audio interfaces go, you know, for the most part, they're all pretty good. They're all kind of similar. Um, basically, what you're paying for are features. So, you know, some will have more inputs. Some will have special um, special DSP maybe built in. Some will come with plugins, VST or AU plugins that you can use. And then, you know, you get a, a some kind of limited license. Um, you know, there, there, there's such a variety of them. Oh, this is really, <laughs> this is pretty old. I just realized this is from Max 2014. I had a doc where I talked about this. Here, let me just let me just pull this up real quickly. It's just worth showing because uh, it it just has some images. But so basically, I've talked about this a lot. I I'm a big Focusrite fan. I use uh, Focusrite. I've got several Focusrites running here now. Really, as far as Premiere and Audition go. I, if it's USB, USB-C, I suppose some may be still using FireWire if you're on older machines. Uh, they'll all work basically just fine. Now, some of them that have kind of internal signal processing and things, you may not be able to access a lot of that if it's sort of on device. Some of them work directly with apps like Logic and some other things. Maybe some of those you can access if they're not external installers. But ultimately, oh, here, let me see. I'm going to share right now. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter. They, they, I, I, I have not heard of too many devices that simply don't work. Um, what will often determine sort of your success or how much you like that particular device are going to be the driver support for the particular OS that you're working in. So again, this is nine years old already, um, but this was a, a, a fairly inexpensive Scarlett, Focusrite Scarlett 8i6. So. Again, what do you what are you paying for when you're buying an audio interface? So this is external. This was a uh, USB USB two. <laughs> yeah, we're going way back. Um, what are you paying for? Well, one, you're paying for 
A to D, D to A conversion, right? So that analog to digital converter, how that sound gets into the device, and then what it sounds like coming out. Um, Focusrite, they've been around a long, long time, started, of course, in the analog domain. Really good, very transparent sounding devices. Not to say they don't have a color, they absolutely do. And that's the thing is, while all these devices may work and sound okay, they don't sound the same. So Focusrite sounds different from, say, um, Avid slash Digi hardware, sounds different from, say, PreSonus, preamp hardware. Um, they're not all going to sound the same uh, to you via headphones, via speakers. They, they, they all have a slightly different color. A lot of that has to do with that A to D, D to A conversion. But aside from that, because for the most part, that doesn't affect how people actually work in the apps, you're largely paying for you know, inputs and connectivity. So in the case of something like this, you can see here it has basically four analog ins. So you have the two combo XLR quarter inch inputs here. And this is pretty standard on most of your USB devices today, right? So you can use XLR inputs or quarter inch inputs directly. You know, front, front panel gain with phantom power. So again, if you're using condenser mics, you don't need a separate preamp unless you want one. Almost all of these devices will have phantom power for, uh, for condenser XLR mics. And then there's two additional quarter inch line inputs on the back. Now, I have people ask me this all the time. Well, it says, uh, you know, 8i6, I'm only seeing four inputs and I'm only seeing four outputs. So where, what, what's happening here? Well, it's also considering, so you have speedif, so this is your digital input. So that's two more, that's another stereo pair. And then you also technically have your MIDI input as well. Um, and then you have your four quarter inch outputs, your MIDI out, your speedif out, and then you have your headphone out as well and a monitor. So that's where you're sort of getting the 8i6 from, but ultimately, whatever your cost allows. Again, most of them are really pretty good. You know, way back in the day when it was, uh, it was more, oh, we're going to get to this. <laughs> like, what the hell? Yes, I'm in a pool. We'll come back to that in a second. You know, it, it used to be in sort of the early PC, late 90s, early 2000s, when you had things like Sound Blaster, and I can't remember the name, what was it? Creative something, and uh, was it Turtle? Turtle Beach, does anybody remember Turtle Beach? All these like consumer gaming audio cards. I mean, even then, most of them were trash. They were garbage. First of all, they were 16-bit cards, so they weren't meant for digital audio recording or, or mixing, period. They were, they were meant for really just to play back game audio and to have an eighth inch mini jack so that you could input a mic while you were playing. They weren't meant for sort of, you know, quote unquote, high fidelity sound. By the time you get into the early 2000s though, where you started seeing just more sort of standard, again, Firewire, uh, USB devices, every, everything got better. And uh, there's so many. And, and again, they can go up way, way in price. You've got you know certain hardware like UAD, which are really amazing. That's where you're paying for the preamp technology, the analog to digital conversion that they're using. UAD's been around a long, long time. They're very expensive. It's very worth it if you're a total Sonic nerd. Now, as a fellow Sonic nerd, let me also say this. I mean, it, it, you know, <laughs> I'm not gonna pay a thousand bucks for a stereo input device uh, because no one else cares. That's the reality, you know. They're all pretty good. Turtle Beach was your first gaming headset, Cody. Yes, I mean, I, I you know, I, I had one too. Uh, and some of them had like surround sound as well, you know, but the, largely it was all kind of gimmicky and they were fine. I mean, they were good for the time. What is up, Stan Arthur? Nice to see you, Richard. How's it going? Okay, so let's see, Richard's saying, don't you agree that Premiere Pro should have the same audio slopes features as Audition? It's so easy to overlay adjust slopes and audition and cost so many clicks in premiere ah, i assume you mean the the auto crossfades yeah and this i believe is something that uh i've seen it on feature lists so and i think we've actually shown some of this in sort of future of video 
uh, presentations where you see a I, I'm assuming that's what you're talking about is the, the, the non-destructive crossfades. Yeah, Premiere needs that. The fact that you have to draw them or even, you know, just set points and then enable Bezier so that you have smooth curves. It's fine. It's a fine workflow. It does seem a little on the old school side, I admit. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm totally with you there. All right, let's see. Uh, and here I was going to just show that for people who are cur who are curious. Let me see if I can open up a a session here. Do we have any sessions? Let's do this one. See uh, before I s share my screen. Let's just see if this is okay. Yeah, this is good enough to show it. Okay, so uh, let me go back to my screen here. So what Richard was talking about is. Uh, you know, and I show this all the time, and this is, again, one of the really great jobs of UI that uh, the audition team has done. So, you know, if you want to crossfade things, you can still manually draw curves, but by default, when you cross over, you know, two audio clips, you'll see that the crossfade gets drawn automatically. And then you have control, uh, visual control, non-destructively to adjust... Uh, you know, the fade in, fade out curve, i.e. intensity, or also make it log or linear. And then, let's see if you hover over this. Yeah, so you'll see, so option, you hold down option, that's going to give you symmetric fades. You'll see how that works. This is very small here, so it's kind of hard to see the symmetric fade happening. Um, that'll give you symmetrical fades, which is nice if you hold down option. Oh, there you go. That's That's nice. So you have a couple of uh, keyboard shortcut modifiers here. What's the other one? Command to change the fade shape. So, you know, again, you can get... In the old Pro Tools, you used to have custom shapes, which, to be honest, they're, they're pretty awesome. You'd think, well, wouldn't you want to sort of customize yourself? It can get a little confusing, but this, this works just as well uh, to do that. And then what's the third one? Shift key to either... What does that say? <laughs> to fade duration or shape. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, so fixed. The, the shape stays the same, but you just adjust duration. Yeah. So a couple nice keyboard shortcut modifiers. Uh, again, you can always, of course, adjust the in and out after the fact. But Premiere should work this way. We, sh we should have this. This is just really good implementation here. Great user experience. Um, and I agree with you 100% that Premiere totally could benefit from that. Okay, let's see what else we got here. Why does AE flip through all of my timelines and reset them every time I switch workspaces? Oh, interesting. So are you saying your your the the comps that you have open in the timeline when you switch workspaces, they they did some disappear? Yeah, this is a problem that I've seen in, in Premiere as well. Um, I wasn't aware that that was actually happening in After Effects at present. In fact, here, I'm willing to open it up and take a look for myself. But it's obviously a bug uh, that should not be happening. Again, I've seen it, I've seen it occur in, um, in Premiere. It's a drag. Uh, and what, what we're talking about is that in Premiere, so you know, you have, you're in a workspace, you have, say, four tabs open in a particular order, and then you switch to the mixing workspace or something else, and suddenly not only are your tabs not open, but you, might, you may not have no tabs open, or you'll have one of the four or something. Um, yeah, that shouldn't be doing that. So definitely let me, you know, if you want to ping me, I got I to gotta check into that, Mike. Um, I'm opening up After Effects as we speak, by the way. So that, that would be something to, because uh, I wasn't aware that that was happening there. Okay. Stan Arthur, do you know if Quantize Audio is on the list of coming attractions for audition? Ah, uh, <laughs> uh, Stan, you hit me, you hit me right in the heart there. Not, it's not really your fault. Uh, short answer, no. No, because most, more than likely, we are not, uh, we are not adding any MIDI functionality to Audition anytime soon, which is a drag and a loss because I would love for that to be the case. But uh, I don't think it's in the cards. 
I'd love it to be. You know, that's one of the most common requests we uh, we get, which is why you know to have audition be a full fledged DAW. And honestly, the only thing it's really missing is the sort of MIDI VSTI component, as you all know. That's why I don't. I still record everything manually because I can't use MIDI here. Not that I necessarily would anyway. I, I, in truth, I haven't used MIDI in earnest for any production I've done since the late 80s. Uh, maybe a few times in the 90s. <laughs> but especially after graduating at Berkeley, I was like, man, I, I can play to a click. I don't need to, I don't need to quantize anything. So very, uh, you know very musician-like in that regard. <laughs> Snob. No, but um, I sure wish we had it, Stan. You know, um, you'll be the first to know if it, if it, uh, if it happens there. Mohammed Reza, what's happening? Okay. Richard Del Connor is asking, how do I raise the RMS value in Adobe Audition while lowering or maintaining the noise floor below 60 dB? What is a workflow to include normalizing compression no NR? I'm not exactly sure. I'm not exactly sure what you mean to include normalizing compression. Um, as far as raising RMS, so here, if we just take this little clip here, let me uh, switch over real quick. So, oh, sorry, wrong, uh, wrong screen. Uh, so. First of all, just to come back to a, a standard here. So when we're talking about RMS, for those who are uninitiated audio nerds, uh, that stands for root, root mean squared. What we're talking about is, is a traditional legacy loudness measurement, average loudness measurement that's measured in decibels relative to full scale, as opposed to uh, today where most productions, whether for audio specifically or audio for video, we use kind of this um, this newer LUFS scale, which is loudness units relative to full scale. Um, and when we talk specifically in the US, we're sort of measuring against this ITU standard. So one of the things you can do, of course, is via uh, amplitude statistics is you can scan and you can then see your RMS values. Again, these are going to be your averages. Now, typically, you know, if you look at sort of loudness units, in which case this at this uh, particular track is coming up at around minus 20. Um, max RMS here is averaging around minus 16. You can see the minimum RMS is right around minus 60 dB. Um, it's also telling us our dynamic range here, which is pretty pretty minimal. Um, to increase RMS, you're going to use some kind of compression or limiting. I mean, so if you're trying to measure, if you're trying to increase RMS, and how do you how do you measure that dynamically? Uh, we don't really have uh, an effect that'll measure that. Now, let's see. If we go into where is it now? Is it uh, special? So if we go into our loudness meter. This one, I'm, I can't remember if this even does. Does this do RMS? No, it only does LUFS. Yeah, so this is a new loudness meter. I don't know if anybody's seen this. Just wait a couple seconds here. Um, so again, this is all measuring real-time LUFS. Uh, yeah, this doesn't even have RMS. Let me see if the... Yeah, let me grab something. I'm going to grab another... Let me grab a different audio track. Bear with me here for one sec. This is some of that stuff that I was doing for uh, Roger Nichols' family, so I'm not going to play Donald Fagan on here as much as I'd like to. Um, let me just grab a, another file. Okay, I'll grab one of our podcast files. All right. So the short answer, as mentioned, is you're going to, uh, you know, you would, you would, use compression and or limiting to increase the loudness there. I mean, that is that is the answer. Now, lots of different ways you could do that. Why can't I find any audio files? For heaven's sake. Just, can I get something that's not commercial? 
here. Okay, this was uh, this is fine. I'll use this Little mono mono drum test here. Just scan this out. So uh, let's go into special again. Loudness radar. So this is our um, this is the TC Electronic loudness radar meter that we also use here. I don't think this will measure real time RMS either. It does not. It does not. Yeah. So I don't know exactly. You maybe you can clarify for me if you're looking to be able to monitor that change in real time. The nice thing about all of these is that you can in fact monitor how you're affecting loudness over time in real time as you're making those adjustments. Here, unfortunately, I guess the only the only the other thing you could do in theory is uh, again this is not it's not a, a, a an exact science here, but you know if you right click on your uh, on your level meter, you can have it show valleys. So using dynamic peaks. So this will kind of show you uh, some real time averages. So let's see, this is uh, again, this is just like a mono, mono drum test here. Okay, so if we're looking at this, If you can see the <laughs> the valley line, so it's giving you the average. It looked like it was, you know, somewhere between minus uh, minus twelve and minus twenty ish. Again, not an exact science here. So again, if we were to sort of look at, so that's just me eyeballing it. And in this case, yeah, maximum RMS was around minus eleven, total minus twenty seven, minimum minus. So. I don't, I don't know if that's what you're looking for. Unfortunately, yeah, we don't we don't have a way to now there's a bunch of plugins. Because in radio and broadcast, they're still often measuring, you know, there's lots of different scales. So a couple of plugins can give you all those different real time measurements here. It's a uh, it's an it's a one time sort of uh, quote unquote, you know, a processed not destructive, but a processed uh, value based on the entire duration. Uh, that's this is uh, today the only way in audition that we can um, we can effectively uh, measure RMS, which again is kind of a, a legacy value. So if you're talking to people who are producing stuff again for say Spotify or for Netflix or you know even for YouTube, everyone's more concerned with LUFs these days. Love it, hate it, whatever. I, I can't honestly say outside of talking to people in radio that I hear RMS ever come up. So kudos. We know, we know when you and I came about in the industry. <laughs> uh, okay. Vashi. Hey, what's up, Vashi? Vashi Nedemansky. Had Vashi here on the stream many, many times. You will all know him. Incredible filmmaker, editor, director, uh, working on his current uh, documentary, Big Ned. Vashi Nedemansky, check out his site. He's got also tons of free content, tons of tutorials. You've seen him all over our channels. Vashi's asking, what's your favorite way to create ring outs in Premiere or Audition? I still send clips from Premiere to Audition and add silence to end of the clip, plus effect, then save. Yeah, I, yeah that's, that's kind of how I do it too. I'm doing less of that these days, but that is still, that's still sort of my method. Um, Maybe the only difference is that I'll often just send the entire sequence and assemble that way. Um, and then render back to Premiere so it's all sort of self, it's all, it's all, it's already there and it's already back in Premiere's timeline in the multitrack synchronized against the original uh, clips because now you have generated stems. So that's maybe the only difference for me, but uh, that's, that is the way I do it. Okay, looking at LinkedIn here. Uh, when will Essential Audio Panel support audio ducking based on conflicting frequency ranges, not merely volume? Think of it like the outside the club effect where you duck the high and mid ranges to make more space for human voice. So in that case, Richard, that, that, is, that is true sidechain ducking, but that would be sidechain ducking via 
EQ, you know, um, right? So you're 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 ducking 2k to 5k, you know, in this, you know, uh, as opposed to a volume based. Really excellent, um, excellent feature request. I'll need to look into that. I want to say I think that's been that's been requested. I know I certainly have requested to have true side chaining, right? So that you could side chain a compressor for the purpose of ducking. You could side chain an EQ for the purpose of frequency based cutouts and effectively ducking. We just need robust. Now you can do this in audition, right? So with audition and some third party EQs, you can do just that. You can also do via our dynamics processor. Now, again, I've talked about this at length. Um, and Richard, I, I, I trust, <laughs> known you a long time. Uh, and I won't unfortunately see you at IBC because I, I no longer do those shows. But uh, I hope you enjoy it this year. You'll see my colleague, hopefully Esteban there. But um, not exactly the same, but in conjunction, because you can use the dynamics processor as a standalone uh, ducking compressor via side chaining in Audition. And by the way, for those joining the stream, I just did a live stream on how to create a side chain auto side chain duck with compression just a few weeks ago. So if you look on my YouTube channel, Jason Levine Video, it's there. I think it's even chapterized. Um, it's easy to follow along. But one of the things that this particular dynamics processor has is frequency band limiting compression. So if, for instance, you want to compress only the vocal range of something, or again, maybe you're trying to compress cymbals and it's just, it's a really particular ring in a specific area. So you're effectively doing kind of multi-band by choosing what bands it's affecting. You can do that here. So this is sort of one of those little unknowns. Most people never even go into this tab. As I've mentioned, I love the sound of this Dynamics processor. It is, it's just, it's just the worst though for actually using practically. First of all, I hate graph-based compression, despise. Second of all, it's missing a few standard controls. Third of all, nobody understands level detector versus gain processor, but that's because this UI was done 20 plus years ago by non-musicians, <laughs> by non-audio engineers. It's amazing, it sounds great, there's some really good presets, many of which I authored years ago to get you started. It's just very confusing to use and it's not standard. We thankfully now do have a gain reduction meter and you do see, you know, sort of real time, uh, you do get real time sort of feedback in here these days, which is nice. And again, you can kind of set multiple points here and then you have, you can, you know, again, increase things like input gain and create really nice kind of pumping and breathing effects. Okay. It sounds awesome. It's just it's just a little confusing to set for most people. But anyway, so to answer your question, yes, we need frequency frequency based ducking. We don't have it yet. I will look into it, Richard, to see if that's a feature request. Um, if not, we should add that to uh, we should put that up in the forums. But I will. Um, Maybe I'll start a Reddit about that too. That's a really great one. Okay. All right. Oh, I see Richard Del Connor saying, okay, regarding RMS, I have a tedious workflow of manually lowering down lar largest peaks so I can normalize it overall to a higher value, then limiting it, then compressing it, then hopefully not needing denoise. Yeah, I mean, Look, not knowing, uh, okay, when I submit my files to audio, Audible audiobooks, they give me the RMS readings of my files and whether I am within the margins. What's up, Simsy? Yeah, so the thing is, uh, so specifically with regard to that, okay, so this makes sense. So first of all, and I don't wanna, I don't wanna derail too, too much here, and this is a good example. Now, this is just a drum file here, but this is, this is a good example of, you know, so let, let's assume you're talking Audible, so maybe it's an audio book, right? So, I don't know when you say you want to, you're tamping down peaks if you're coming in and sort of manually, you know, adjusting gain of peaks. So you say you want every peak at minus, if they're all roughly around minus nine, you drag them to minus nine and then you can normalize to minus 0.1, right, to get everything so you have the most headroom available. I am assuming you're not doing that. That is where you would use sort of, you know, stage one compression to tame all of the out of bound peaks to keep things fairly consistent, right? 
So this is where, again, using something like, you know, a more traditional, it's not my favorite sonically, but it's a good one in terms of um, just uh, real-time metering, something like, you know, this, uh, this tube-modeled compressor. So, you know, if I were just to take a quick look here, so let's say we're going to do, a, yeah, four to one for drums. Faster release. All right, I'm not giving it any additional gain here. And, you know, we're not doing aggressive compression here. Basically hovering in the minus four to minus seven or eight range. So remember, what that means is, you know, for every four decibels above the threshold, it's one at the output, you know, so if it's eight decibels above the threshold, it's two decibels at the output. So, you know, this is where I would use something like this to kind of even out those peaks. Now, again, I may need a slightly faster attack because it didn't capture some of these little transients, but now everything is roughly, you know, minus seven. So this gives me, you know, six point something decibels approximately, and this is 5.5 um, of headroom to increase. But so I would use that first stage compression. Again, I didn't want to you know, if you're wanting to, it's easier to slam those peaks with a voice versus drums where I'm trying to preserve a little bit of dynamics here. Done that, done very quickly. But I would do that and then, yes, normalize. Now, limiting, sure, if you're just trying to make things overall more loud and if you use a brick wall limiter, that'll allow you to create a ceiling, let's say, you know, one decibel below zero to really push things forward. But yes, that could in turn amplify, you know, room ambience or room tone or noise that you don't want. You need to be careful about that. But a lot of that has to do with how it's captured as well, right? If the capture is bad, then you're going to have to denoise. So cleanest capture possible. Yes, that matters. Ultimately, if you have a clean capture, you shouldn't really have to worry about noise post compression unless there was something, you know, unnecessarily lingering in the background. All that said, the match loudness panel is a great way to deliver content for podcasts. And the reason I say that is, so let's take this file and drag this in here. So this again, now this is using similar to, uh, to amplitude statistics when you drop a file in here. So it does in fact give you your ITU standard, your, your total RMS loudness and perceived. Okay, so these are the classic RMS values. Okay, so classic loudness, classic perceived. These are both RMS figures. Uh, peak is related to dBFS, classic scale, right? True peak is directly related to the loudness unit scale. What you can do here is, now I don't know about Audible, but I'm assuming it's similar to, to Apple Podcast and Spotify. You know, they have a delivery requirement of minus 16 luffs. Now again, maybe Audible's different. I know for a fact Spotify and Apple Music want it measured in LUFs. So, and minus 16 is kind of the podcast standard for that with a max true peak of minus one. So you can set that here and run it, okay? And what that's going to do by default, now that's, I didn't add any limiting, it's automatically adding a limiter as needed, okay? And you'll see what it ultimately did to those peaks, right? And now if I, if I scan this, go into amplitude statistics here, okay, we should have something that's within that minus 16. Now this is again, a little bit different here, but, uh, and you can see again, your RMS value is not going to, it's never going to be the same as your, as your LUFS value. But as you look at your perceived loudness here, this kind of gives you a better idea in terms of range about how they, how similar, sort of where the, where the relationship lies between LUFs and RMS, this might be something for you to consider without going through so many additional stages. Now, this is adding some limiting. So ultimately, you still may run into noise potentially if you have noise in that original source. I would probably say if the noise is not bad, you want to typically tackle that noise up front and make sure that if you process that you don't have any artifacts. Okay. All right. What's up, Anthony? What's up, Theo? Theo. 150. A lot of audition questions today. Wow. Uh, 
Gino, why, oh sorry, 150 Metri, why is there no new major developments for Audition? Good question, although I did see that this week we just did release some bug fixes and some other things, so that is good news. Um, but yes, Audition is, it's in, it's in need of some, some feature love. I, I agree, I agree wholeheartedly. All right, that said, uh, let's talk real briefly about uh, podcasts, because I just want to show you something real quick. Um, okay. Oh, I see, Stan, you're talking about processing pre-recorded audio. I've seen it in other DAWs as a way to improve kick and snare. Yes, yeah, 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 but the concept is the same, right? So yes, sorry, I, I, I assumed you meant quantized with regard to MIDI. So you're talking about like what Logic has where, or I think um, Ableton has that where, yes, you can take a, a real-time drum performance and it will do real-time quantization, let me rephrase that, it'll do quantization of non-MIDI based audio, yes. I could see something like that coming because now I would imagine via AI, that's probably pretty easy. Um, no, no ETA on such a thing. I'd love to see that actually, that would be cool. Again, for me personally, I wouldn't use it in that way because snobbery, no. But uh, I, I actually, I have used it on other people's productions in Ableton, I believe. Um, it's great. So yes, thanks for the clarification. Yeah, I, I would love to see that. Okay. Robert Holly, what is up, dude? Yes, perceived and RMS. Perceived the default minus 23 LUFs, EBU standard will produce audio that is approximately 25% of full scale. Yeah, and again though, it, it depends based on what your maximum dbtp decibels true peak level is set to there's several variables involved there and also based on what standard european broadcast standard is different from the us one is sl slightly different from the canadian one slightly different from the japanese one although they're all within a decibel or two of each other uh, but again based on where you're going with that uh, like i said almost everything today is measured in luffs it's nice to have rms I've not, I've not, I've not seen anyone. It's nice to see someone requesting it. That's why we still show it. Uh, in any case, okay. Podcast. So, talked about enhanced speech before, and I just wanted to show you that we've made some updates to this. So this is why I have this. <laughs> so again, for those of you who've not heard it, Adobe Podcast Enhance is some new technology that we have, AI based that does just amazing things to clean up your audio. I've shown this a couple of times. It is truly amazing and it's constantly being updated and changed, all right, and improved. It is also, at some point soon, again, download the Premiere beta, it will be coming to Premiere. I, have no, I can't give you an ETA, it will be coming though. And this was based on user requests, largely on the Reddits, but everywhere people want this functionality in Premiere. So let me just play the original here for you. And I did this just as a test a week or two ago. So this is me. Uh, well, yeah, I'll just play it for you. Speak for it'll it'll speak for itself. <laughs> okay, so this is a test to see how well Enhance does with extreme background noise. Keeping in mind that I'm trying to talk right into the camera, but we've got a waterfall behind us and it's super noisy. Okay. Now the audio itself is clear, so that's not an issue. Problem is that it's, it's just it's just like overtaken by the waterfall noise, right? So this is kind of an extreme example and I was curious to see what it would do. Now, partly why I wanted to try this is because of one of the new uh, additions that we've added to Podcast Enhance. I'm hoping that I'll see it when I upload the file. So what I did here was I just extracted the audio from this separately. So here's just the audio of that video. Okay, so this is a test to see how well. Okay. So just, and this, by the way, this is all on the phone, of course. So if we bounce over to this, let's go ahead and import that. So that's called pool waterfall. All right, open this. It's going to enhance it. And then assuming I, I maybe I need to, uh, 
clear my cache. I'm hoping I'm going to see. We just added a, an intensity slider. So what's really cool about that, and this is something which people have been asking for since we, um, since we started offering this podcast enhance online, it's the ability to effectively dial back some of the original sound, which may include noise or ambient sound or room tone. And uh, so basically like a wet dry balance of the effect. Aha, there it is. So what's really cool about this is again, you have the ability to, to, to retain or dial back some of that ambient sound. So just real quick, we're gonna process a new one. So I did one, this was at 90%. So here is the result that I had already. And we're going to try one with a little bit less. And I'll see if I, I, I didn't try if we could preview it in there with the change too. So we'll check that out. But here it is processed with 90% removal. So what that's doing, again, is it's, it's leaving a little bit of the waterfall element there because it would probably be very strange and it would feel like ADR if you didn't hear some water, right? I mean, it just it would, well, you would think, okay, well, obviously he overdubbed that because I'm not hearing any waterfall. So here is the result directly from podcast at 90%. Check it out. Okay, so this is a test to see how well Enhance does with extreme background noise, keeping in mind that I'm trying to talk right into the camera. And let's turn the original on again. But we've got a waterfall behind us and it's super noisy. Oh, let's see. Let's see how it does, right? Okay, this is an example. This is a test to see how well Hans does with extreme background noise. Now, one of the things that um, I've talked to the team about is that, of course, this is... So you might think, wow, that's amazing. Or you might think, wow, that's cool. Or you might think, wow, that sounds terrible because it sounds like you're on a Shure SM7B while in a pool and you're not. So your brain and your eyes can't resolve those two things and what... what so correct. So it is modeling after a sort of podcast sort of sound, which in that environment may seem a little odd. So this is where perhaps using some of the strength or the uh, intensity can maybe, you know, smooth over some of those edges. So that was at 90%. It's also worth pointing out just for transparency here. I did add a little bit of EQ to bump up uh, some of the sort of mids and, and upper mids around AK just to give a little a little more, a uh, little, little shimmer quality here, kind of a wide, uh, wide Q value. I also dipped down some of the lower, lower mids, um, 130. Again, this is kind of a fundamental, an octave fundamental for male voices, but that's where you're going to get a lot of that octave fundamental, again, for podcast, right? That's where you get that warmth. The octave of this below would be approximately 61 hertz, right? That's the fundamental bass note. So didn't need so much of that. Also very narrow Q value. So I, I, I popped a little bit of that out of there. And I did also add just a little bit of ambience because it was too dry. It sounded a little too dry. So very small room, small room size using about 9% of just a, a sort of affected signal here. But let's, let's try this at 50%. And I'm curious if I can preview it with that. So let's see. Okay. Oh, and it's going through those speakers. So this is a test to see how well Enhance does with extreme oh. background noise. Keeping in mind- It is real time. Okay, sorry, it's going through my, I'm not gonna change all that right now. It's going through my Mac's uh, speakers here. But note what I was doing as you're playing, this does actually work in real time. That I'm trying to talk right into the camera, but we've got a waterfall behind us and it's super noisy. All right, so let's try like 66%. Let's download that. So you saw that it took, you know, just a few seconds, 20 seconds to process. We then have real time adjustment while you're playing back. I know it was sort of stuttering. That's fine. It's still working in real time. The download is instantaneous. So if we come back to Premiere here. Let me just uh, second, let's change my screen real quick. All right. 
pool waterfall enhanced one. So here's the one we just did. So you can see that. Okay, import. And uh, let's drop this into a new track. Let's take a listen. Okay, so this is a test to see how well Enhance does with extreme background noise. All right, so that's the new one. Here's the previous one that I did at 90%. Okay, so this is a test to see how well Enhance does with extreme background noise. Keeping in mind that I'm trying to talk right into the camera, but we've got a waterfall behind us. That, that's that's my face of, wow, that's actually pretty significant. Um, really good. So I, maybe I'd even go to 70, you know? Now you might be thinking, okay, that's cool, but I gotta process it and then downloads. That means I'd have to do a 70% and then come back to Premiere and what a drag and blah, blah, blah. Well, ultimately, if this makes it into Premiere, that slider is gonna be in there too. You will be able to do it in real time and 90% chance that's going to appear inside of Essential Sound. So it'll be real time. That's pretty awesome. So that's really exciting. So again, if you haven't already checked it out, podcast.adobe.com, um, enhance speech. It is, it's amazing. Uh, it is particularly good with on, on axis audio. So even if you're like talking into your camera, DSLR, red, whatever it is, crummy camera mic, but you're on axis, but it's echoey or it's noisy or whatever, you're far away, it, it does shocking restorations, shockingly good, um, sincerely, okay? Okay, question from YouTube, Cody Bear. How do you delete a part of a video, i.e. at the end, if I don't want it in the footage? So you're just talking about ba basic cut, cut and delete here. Um, I mean, number of different ways to do it. As always, there are keyboard shortcuts for everything. I typically don't use them or like to showcase them because I forget them myself, but obviously the simplest way is to use your razor tool. So if you're just talking about cut, literally cutting something out, razor tool, shortcut key C, okay? You just scrub to whatever frame you, you, know, you wanna apply that cut, cut it. Now here, because I have unlinked audio with that video as well, I can just cut across all three, shortcut key V, Right, so that's my move tool. Now I can move all this out, I can extract it, or I can simply, you know, cut it or clear it. All right, now also if I wanted to cut something in the middle, right, so you wanted to do like a, a ripple, again, I'm doing this all with the tool, normally I would do shortcuts, but those are too hard to follow. I can select this little section here, the little silent section, right click, control click. And now if I do a ripple delete, that middle part's gonna go away and the two side parts will snap together. There that is, okay? Really uh, basic, basic chop stuff here. And then of course, if you want, you could, you can crossfade, you could add a blend mode, you know, there's lots of different things that you can, that you can do there. Reverb mic, I just keep a layer of the original to mix with the enhanced layer. Yeah, and that's that's effectively the same thing. Now, the only difference with that, that's what I'd been doing before we added that slider, is you do, now, when it is processed through enhanced speech, it definitely, right, positively, but it, it colors, I almost said color rises, it colors the sound. So you may have, my only caveat with using the original and the enhanced manually and adjusting levels, is that you may have some frequencies that are fighting one another, particularly because the enhanced version enhances things primarily in the, in the low to low mid range, like 6100, 120, even 240 to some degree. So you may have some conflict there that you would have to tackle independently. That's not for you, Mike, that's for others. But I mean, you may have it too, but you know how to account for that. So j just keep that in mind if you're doing that manually. That's a f perfectly adequate workflow one I've implemented myself. But that's the thing is you, you can have sort of frequency clash uh, in doing that. And that enhanced slider, once it's implemented uh, in the app, will hopefully take care of that. 
Enhance sometimes takes out the S. Yeah, it can do, and I've reported this too, it can do weird things. Um, it can make things sibilant or it can squash the, the attack of a S sound, which is not wanted. So again, you know, it's not entirely perfect, but that's again, one of those things that I've, I've found that even backing off, if you're finding that that's happening, backing off a few percent. So instead of processing at what would have been a hundred before you had no choice, do it at 95 or 92. It actually restores some of that, you know, if it's not terribly frequent. Um, you can also pre-treat a file carefully for sibilance in advance of applying enhanced speech, which also helps preserve S's without incurring additional sibilance and those sort of uh, artifacts. Okay. All right. All right. What's your favorite approach to mixing dialogue and music together without ducking to get an even legible audio blend? Yeah, I mean, that's all without, that's all, all about the compressor. And to be honest, that's a great question, Vashi. So we're talking about mixing, you know, dialogue, music and things without doing the duck. Obviously you can have some, some standard frequency, uh, frequency based cutouts using parametric equalizers. Um, either at a clip level, if necessary. I don't typically do that. In general, I will often not create a scoop out for music, but I'll, you know, I'll attenuate certain things in the middle, especially if it's, you know, if it's a more sort of uh, a busier commercial track versus just underscore where melodic elements won't necessarily fill the mid range. But you want to use something like to really glue them together and still have the sense of dynamics between the two without ducking. I highly recommend the uh, the Waves LA-2A <laughs> uh, compressor or something like the, which is, you know, this is a, an emulation of a classic analog compressor or something like the Yuri 1176 uh, tube and or opto based compressors are going to give you that very smooth, dynamically glued together kind of sound. A lot of that also has to do with the ratio. You know, again, what you're seeing now is a lot of just overly compressed content. Now that's going to glue everything together easily. Um, the problem is, is that you just, it sucks away all dynamics. I've said this many times, and Vashi, I know we've talked about this. I see a lot of modern movies where, you know, the screaming, ah, is as loud as the, they're coming for you, whisper. And I guess there's a certain um, element of being able to keep you in the moment when it's like that, because the sound, the, the level really never dies. So you're always constantly engaged. That said, and I talked about this several months ago, I took my youngest to go see Rocky, a new 4K print of Rocky, where admittedly, while the while the visual was beautifully restored, the sound, it may have been restored, but it really, I mean, it all, it sounded like a like a one mic Nagra recording. It was <laughs> it was pretty rough. And the sound the sound design was pretty rough. Hey, it's 1976. But um what I right away noticed seeing an older film in a theater in a, you know, a Dolby theater, no less. And what even my young son noticed was that when there were quieter parts, and there's moments where Rocky's talking to Adrian and they're sort of, you know, whispering. The dialogue was noticeably quieter than when they were, hey, you know, shouting or whatever. And that, gosh, it was such a welcome change. So typically what I'll say is, you know, regardless of whether you use analog or opto compression, Having longer release times for one allows things to, again, stay glued when necessary. And then as, as the fader riding, I mean, that's the other thing too, right, Vashi, is that if you're not going to duck, you have to have a certain amount of riding the fader, which is ducking effectively, but it's not, it's not to necessarily pull things out of range. It's just to, to, to rebalance for effect and to preserve some dynamic movement. You don't have to do it. 
Again, compression can kind of do it for you. Throw a brick wall limiter on top of that, and that'll, again, continue to push everything forward. But that's, I, I use that way more. I mean, that's the funny thing is I almost never use, almost never use ducking ever. It's always compression based or again, little EQ tricks or just slight fader moves. I mean, that's the thing. If you're not squashing everything to death, very, and, and by the way, and your dialogue in advance should be compressed to be fairly consistent overall. Now, if you're limiting it because you want those whispers to be as, as loud or as present as regular volume dialogue, that's a choice, you know, that's a choice you can make. But as long as you have the dialogue already pre-treated where you just, you know, you don't have 15 decibels of dynamic range, you shouldn't have to, you know, you wouldn't have to do all that much going sort of the riding fader compression way. I mean, I know you know all this, dude. <laughs> okay. A lot of audio today. Charles Denham, I have an audio question. There are two gain levels. Oh my God, we're almost out of time. Sorry, Charles, I'm gonna have to answer you offline because we're out of time. How did this happen? This is what happens, friends, when we're having fun. All right, well, on that note, uh, I hope everyone has a great weekend. Take care. Charles, I'm gonna stay on so I can answer your question. Have a good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world, and we'll see you again next time. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.